welcome back to the last part, the last 75 minutes of day three here at the Sustainable Innovation Forum on mobility and transport and how that is having to change so fast. I'm Nick Gowing, founder and director of the Thinking the Unthinkable project. Let me just give you one personal reflection of the kind of thing we've been hearing, particularly today, from the next generation. Extraordinary how well they are thinking about at the age of 14, 15, 16, how aware they are of these new realities that we are discussing here at the Sustainable Innovation Forum over five days. I've been very struck by the radical tone at every level of what is needed now. The money is there in many ways. The issue is connecting it with the technology. Uh, the need, the rush to bridge, build that bridge between what is needed now, particularly to address the climate emergency and the technology that there is and the ability to scale up and deliver. And that's something we're going to be addressing shortly with uh, a senior figure from BMW in Munich, Dr. Thomas Becker, who is the Vice President of Sustainability Mobility for the BMW Group. So please get your questions in at this point, any comments you want to make and the challenges uh, to BMW. Then we'll be going back to Brussels again, to Marusha from the Slowcat uh, Partnership for our final panel to, for today. Um, the 60% of the world will live in cities, but how will they be moving within them? If you want to put a comment, if you want to put a question, do please do it. It's a great way of creating a, a spirit of conversation here, as you saw with Simon King from uh, Mighty uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, go to the platform, press live, that question button, uh, file your question, file your comment, tell us who you are. Um, you, don't, you don't have to represent an organization, just tell us who you are and if necessary, who you want that question to. And obviously, uh, if you want it to Dr. Becker from BMW, uh, put that very clearly because otherwise it can gel and morph a bit into the next uh, session as well. So let's now move to uh, uh, Dr. Becker. Uh, and I should underscore to you that these are the uh, these are the contacts on social media, hashtag Climate Action Live, hashtag SIF20, uh, and you can follow us at, at climate underscore action underscore. So let's move ahead. Uh, do find any way to communicate with us to Dr. Thomas Becker, who's Vice President of Sustainability and Mobility for BMW Group. Dr. Becker, I hope you can hear me in Munich. Good afternoon. Excellent. Um, Hi, Nick. Excellent. We have about 25 minutes, uh, Thomas. Um, can I put to you something which uh, Dr. Uh, Florian Weig, your senior vice president, said right at the beginning? It's that catch line that you use here, um, that uh, we don't do sustainability at BMW. We make the BMW group sustainable. Help us understand, as head of sustainability, how that can be defined. Well, this is all about integration. It's about properly integrating the sustainability dimension into the product, which you may say is something that is ongoing since years now looking at the electrification agenda. But it also means integration into our production processes. And, and this is a very big step forward that is also a challenge, integrating sustainability in the way of managing the supply chain. So that also includes closing material loops in, a few, in the future to a degree that goes way beyond what we are doing so far and what the is doing so far in order to bring the carbon footprint down uh, by a higher level of circularity. So all of those changes, you can't successfully address them by saying, okay, sustainability is an, an add-on that comes into the business and then needs to be aligned with what you would do otherwise it needs to be integrated right from the start and much deeper than we have seen that uh, in the past. Now, BMW has made its uh, reputation, its wealth, uh, its prosperity uh, and its name from the internal combustion engine. I, I preface my, uh, my question by saying that, by ask, to ask the question, how much is it an uphill job to change the mindset within an enormous corporation like yours to understand that what you've got to produce now is rather different, significantly different technologically from what you've made your money from in the past? Well, I mean, if you look at uh, what is happening at the moment is that 
one plant after the other is starting to make electric vehicles. So we make, for example, our X5 and X3s plug-in hybrids in Spartanburg, South Carolina. We will uh, export, uh, starting still this year, uh, the electric uh, X3 uh, compact SAV, uh, which is made at our plant in China. Uh, we will produce the I4 uh, fully electric uh, four-door coupe uh, from next year onwards uh, here in Munich. And that means that uh, with this transition, uh, we also have a huge need to requalify the workforce, to train people, to uh, also internally communicate very strongly uh, where things are moving into. And, and predominantly, it's a question of uh, being able to tell the entire team at BMW that we are successful with that. And that's what we are. We are now in the two-digit share of EVs uh, uh, of our European sales. We will uh, meet at least uh, the requirements uh, for the European market in 2020. Uh, we have a, a strong ramp up uh, of EV sales globally. So by end of next year, we will have sold 1 million of uh, vehicles uh, with an electric drivetrain and we will go up to about 7 million by 2030. So very clearly, electric driving emission reduction becomes an integral part of our future success. And this is, I think, what people at BMW also understand. But of course, those who've been working for you for 10, 20, 30 years They've got into a certain mindset, and I put that to you because whether it's BMW or any major corporate, just mm. changing the culture, the behavior and mindset, is that something, before we get onto the business of mobility, just to understand that this is a real challenge for you internally. Those who've been putting together cars in Leipzig or Munich in a certain way are having to think differently and contribute differently. Is that right? Well, technology changes, but some central elements of what makes a company's success will remain the same. And this is the ability to successfully integrate one of the most complex industrial products that there are. So uh, this means managing a supply chain uh, in a way that works efficiently uh, is the same for a combustion engine or for an electric drivetrain. The kind of partnership that you need to develop with your suppliers is the same. So there are differences, obviously, in the hardware that you do. But if you look at the skills, the software, the way to think and plan and act, there are also strong traditions uh, which also benefit us uh, very clearly in, uh, in our way into the future. Let's talk about the supply chain because that is so critical. You're dealing with uh, companies who technically are very independent of you, and therefore are not under direct control from your board and from right. managers like you. How much of this is a major challenge, actually getting even suppliers who rely on contracts with you to change substantially? Well, to put it into perspective, if you look at the average car we built 2019, it had a footprint of 10 tons of CO2 on average before we started assembling it. So that's 10 tons which were included in the steel, in the aluminum, in the plastic uh, that uh, is uh, built uh, into the components uh, that will make a car. So with electrification, this goes up significantly. So by 2030, we would end up at an average of 14 tons in 2030 due to the much higher energy intensity of uh, battery cells, namely, who are very energy intense to make. So as we have a clear commitment to also manage our supply chain in a way that is in the target corridor of the Paris Agreement, we need to get this down until 2030 to eight tons. So we have to have a reduction of net 20% at least. So that means that we certainly need, for example, steel to be made with a much lower CO2 footprint. That means in concrete terms that we have agreed with all three battery cell suppliers that we have globally, that they will exclusively use renewable energies for supplying BMW with battery cells. But this is something Nick, that you can't dictate. It doesn't work in the way of making public announcements. This is what we expect you to do. It really means working in partnership. And this is what also for any other car, not only electric ones, uh, I think is uh, at the core of our philosophy in dealing with the supply chain, 
that we seek to solve these huge challenges uh, in dialogue uh, with our partners uh, in the chain. But clearly, energy now, is one step, and the next one is circular. I'm getting a lot of very good questions, so let's try and uh, keep this brisk mm -hmm. if we can, uh, Thomas. Again, the issue of recycling, okay. about yeah. cars being recycled, about materiel being recycled, how much is that now central? Uh, almost a conditionality to building the car. Well, so far, wherever you look in the uh, global markets, we are obliged to make cars in a way that you can recycle them so that 95% uh, can be used by somebody else, for example, in the construction industry when we talk about steel. But very clearly in the future, we need higher rates of recycled materials that go into our product. So at the moment, we are roughly at 20% secondary steel that we goes into cars. This has to become more. Uh, if you look at battery cells, I mean, today there is no big recycling market for battery cell material, as we are still in relatively no numbers. But we have to strategically prepare for a situation where we need to get back more of that stuff in order to feed it back uh, into the production, in order to bring the CO2 footprint of our product down. So uh, this is uh, hugely challenging. And what you see is that, for example, when you look at the requirements for uh, the recycling of batteries, China has the most advanced regulatory system so far. So they are strongly progressing in that regard. We see an intense debate in Europe. We expect the same to happen in the US. So we think that it is really needed to have uh, a discussion between industry, the regulators and all stakeholders about how can we close more material loops uh, when it comes to the automotive industry? Now, we may zigzag a bit over several issues here, but bear with me as I, as I move down the list of uh, good questions. Uh, picking up on battery technology, Harry Simons from Harry Shepard Limited. How do you reconcile the requirement for rare earth metals in batteries and the impact of extracting such materials from the environment? Are there alternatives? Mm. Well, our current generation of electric drivetrains do not use rare earth for the uh, powertrain. Uh, we have uh, also, and this is not about rare earth, it's about cobalt in that case, uh, very clearly uh, decided not to source this stuff from Congo, for example, because the situation there in many cases is unsustainable with a view to human rights, for example. This is why we source directly as BMW cobalt from Australia and from Morocco, and then supply our suppliers, the cell producers, with that material. So from a premium manufacturer, you can rightly expect that you take care of risks associated uh, with your supply chain properly. And uh, we seek to uh, absolutely meet that expectation with what we are doing. Good. Um one of the critical issues I wanted to raise with you is your model for mobility. And this is picked up um, by Eduardo Vandenberg, a professor from the Federal University of Lavras in Brazil. Is there any intention of BMW to move more strongly from vehicles for personal transportation to vehicles for mass transportation? In other words, what mobility model is now emerging for you? Well, very clearly, we have made uh, a clear choice that uh, our product uh, is a car uh, and not buses. So uh, while we uh, offer vehicles for a wide range of customers, we stay out of the market uh, for public transport. That is uh, a, a clear choice we have uh, taken. Um, so when we talk about urban mobility, we talk about uh, uh, supporting initiatives uh, which make urban mobility more sustainable. We depend for the success of our electric products on the availability of electric charging infrastructure, for example. We have a joint venture with Daimler uh, when it comes to uh, ride uh, sharing, when it comes uh, to uh, uh, digital uh, taxi and ride hailing services. So we think that there is a big potential in digitizing and flexibilizing the use of cars in an urban environment, but cars will remain our business and motorcycles, obviously, as well. But let me press you very hard on this. There's a next generation coming. 
who want to drive cars but don't, won't have the money necessarily to buy them or even to uh, pay for a lease and so on. Are you, do, you, do you have at the back of your mind a fear that actually the demand for cars will be on a very different scale through sharing, through communities and so on, which in its own way will reduce the chances that people want to have, uh, whether it be aluminum or metal, sitting in a garage for 95% of the time? Well, if you look at our average customer, and this sounds like the easy answer, but I will differentiate a little bit. Our average customer is a commuter. This person lives not in a central part of a city. These people live in the outskirts and the vast majority of them actually needs a car and likes driving a car uh, for getting around in the countryside, but obviously also for commuting uh, into city centers. So that means that uh, we have uh, a strong interest in any instrument which contributes to making mobility into and out of cities more sustainable. For example, reducing uh, the, the time needed for searching for parking by more smart uh, digital infrastructures, uh, by also making electric charging available at the point of interest where you travel. So that is because one side of the coin. The other one is that what we observe is that many people who are the ideal candidates for car sharing are a completely different uh, breed of customers, if you like. They are 15 to 20 years younger than the average person that purchases a new BMW. Uh, they normally either don't have a car in the first place or, in many cases, own a rather old used car uh, which is also not very attractive because it needs, uh, for example, to be paid for when it comes to permanent resident parking permits. So we see that car sharing, if properly managed, replaces older, higher emitting uh, vehicles by urban users, whereas the new car purchase uh, from BMW happens much more, much later in the lifetime uh, of people and also in a different uh, social demographic pattern. So things are, are more complex. Uh, a final remark, if you look at uh, when will people start driving? Yes, the age where people make their driving license is moving. It's not necessarily at the age of 18 anymore. But on the other hand, people keep driving way longer than they used in the past. So the time that people actually drive a car is not getting shorter, it's getting longer on average. So there is a lot of progress in making a driver's license. So what we observe is that this situation is much more complex than it may look at the first rounds. All right, um, infrastructure. Two questions, similar questions from Rob Heaton, Strategy Director of Rebel Energy, and also Ted Sheldon right over mm -hmm. on the University of Victoria on Vancouver Island in Canada, basically saying the same thing. Uh, about infrastructure, particularly recharging mm. points and so on. Uh, particularly the question from Ted Sheldon about whether you're working with other car manufacturers, governments and others, not to force them, yes. but to encourage them to make it very clear that EVs cannot happen if actually you can't drive long distances without um, fast, uh, fast recharging. We keep hammering home that message all the time and very clearly, if you look at the European Union, 70% of public charging infrastructure is installed in just four member states. So uh, the biggest factor that keeps people from even considering to buy an electric vehicle is the non-availability or let's say the perceived lack of public charging infrastructure. So BMW over some years has been uh, contributing to the build-up of charging infrastructure and partnership projects also with other car makers. Uh, we also have, together with our colleagues from some other uh, OEMs, uh, started Ionity. That is a company that is building up a high-power charging infrastructure for really fast charging along the main, Euro uh, main European uh, 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 transit and motorway axles. So very clearly, we are making our contribution as a company on enabling long distance travel by fast charging along the motorways. What we also need are municipalities who support the build up of public charging in the urban area. And this is all about designating public space, 
uh, about putting the right electricity lines into places uh, and to uh, thereby enable uh, urban mobility uh, with electric cars. A final contribution about the digital opportunities that we see is uh, our offering to manage our plug-in hybrid vehicles in a way that whenever they enter city centers, they automatically go into the electric mode, which maximizes their contribution uh, to air quality. So that is just one example where we think not only the physical infrastructure for charging, but also the digital infrastructure in a city or the way vehicles are managed can contribute uh, to making road transport uh, more sustainable. Does that mean that you're thinking that hybrid is a kind of short term transitional technology which will be out of date pretty quickly? That absolutely is a question of the relationship between what people need and uh, what kind of demand side support they face. So the plug-in hybrid is uh, the best option, I think, for people who have a considerable share of their driving being a commute that can be done in a fully electric mode. So for example, 30 or 40 kilometer daily, but who have just this one car in their family. So not the scenario, let's say the one associates it always with California that you have three or four cars in the garage anyway. I'm talking here about people in Europe who depend on one car for the family, which is also suitable, for example, to travel from Munich to Croatia for the summer holidays. And in that case, you end up uh, with the plug-in hybrid being uh, an extremely good proposition. So clearly, in a scenario where you have fully fledged charging infrastructure everywhere, uh, and where this is not an issue anymore, uh, pure battery electric vehicles are able to cover all the needs for mobility. But very clearly, in big parts of our markets, we are by far not there yet. So therefore, we think that plug-in hybrids uh, play a role, uh, at least uh, for the, uh, the years to come and the time horizon until uh, 2030, and depending on what happens also beyond that. Now, picking up on that point you made about going into cities where there's an automatic transition to EV status in a car, uh, this from Katerina, no surname, a senior consultant with Deloitte, I don't know where. How do you see AI and analytics playing a role in decarbonization across your value chain? Well, AI on, uh, on one hand, uh, I think, uh, and we agree, I think, with many other people, not only in the car industry, but beyond, uh, is uh, crucial when it is about really optimizing routing, for example. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the famous city brain concept in China. But apart from that, uh, let's say, uh, name, uh, I think there is vast potential in a better communication between uh, public infrastructure, for example, traffic lights uh, and vehicles. Uh, there is also much better ways to predict uh, traffic density and to manage uh, cities accordingly. Uh, if you look at uh, the uh, connection, for example, also between the energy system and the car system, uh, to make sure, for example, that charging is properly synchronized uh, with uh, uh, the availability of, for example, wind power, uh, would be hugely supported by a digital management of uh, the relationship between cars uh, and the energy utility. So those are just a few examples, but uh, it's uh, hugely important, absolutely. Now, there have been several questions about hydrogen, um, both in terms of mobility and traction, uh, and also uh, what hydrogen can, tr can contribute to the supply chain as well. Um, is BMW investing in hydrogen fuel cell technology for its vehicles to what extent or if not, why not? That from Jack Palace. Now, I have to say at the World Economic Forum it must be, I may be wrong here, 10 years ago, 12, 13 years ago, you mm. did actually produce a hydrogen car, but it never got anywhere. Well, it Correct. did go somewhere, but there was nowhere to refuel it. Is that, is that a technology which is already one step beyond EV? Well, uh, one has to differentiate here. Uh, the event that you are talking about, that has been a hydrogen combustion car. Uh, this technology was not considered to be a full zero emission vehicle by the authorities in California. And for that reason, and some, uh, this never picked up. 
Very clearly, the other pathway is electric driving with a fuel cell that powers the electric drivetrain. So it's an electric car, but you don't store the energy in a battery, you store it in hydrogen. And hydrogen still has the huge advantage of higher energy density and therefore the ability to store the same amount of uh, pro possible propulsion uh, uh, at a lower weight, for example. Uh, so that means that, for example, for vehicles which are used predominantly on very long distances and who would otherwise be very ha heavy, meaning big cars uh, that are used for long, uh, for long distance travel, hydrogen, from our point of view, uh, is a sustainable option and an alternative to storing energy in a battery. But very clearly, the chicken and egg topic, meaning the availability of uh, fueling infrastructure, being a showstopper, uh, is absolutely clear for hydrogen. So one would need an integrated political strategy that includes getting hydrogen to the road in order to make this a possibility. So there is now a discussion about hydrogen becoming a fuel for trucks. So the question how this could develop over the next years, whether we would see uh, a broader uh, rollout of infrastructure, uh, that is the crucial issue. And very clearly, our understanding is that for such a scenario, we want and we will be able to supply uh, the right cars. And we work together with our partners from Toyota uh, when it comes to developing uh, uh, hydrogen fuel cell technology. And interestingly, that uh, answers a question from Michael Cahill, who's the mayor of the city of Beverly in Massachusetts, about the options available, mentioning hydrogen. We're almost out of time, Thomas, mm -hmm. but maybe I could just ask you, there are some questions here suggesting that really the, 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 the time of the car, as we think about it at the moment, as a personal um, vehicle, uh, which sits around for a long period, underused and unused, mm -hmm. is really fast approaching its end. In other words, there has to be a very different way in which we use a car in a community way or whatever way you want to define. Is that, is that very much on BMW's horizons and radar at the moment? The idea that maybe even your model for the assumption of personal ownership could be dramatically overtaken by other new realities? Well, I'm not so sure whether this really happens that fast. I mean, if you look back two or three years ago, there was a, a big, broad enthusiasm uh, about, uh, for example, ride hailing being uh, the mode of transport that would replace the private car. We haven't seen that. Uh, we have seen big evidence that ride hailing, depending on the way it is operated, uh, can uh, reduce actually the demand for public transport much more strongly than the demand for private vehicles. And very clearly, the needs of people while they use a car are hugely different. And uh, we have done that in a survey with uh, the University of Karlsruhe when we asked people in such different places like Berlin, Shanghai uh, uh, and San Francisco uh, why they are actually traveling in a car. And you had one third of people who said, well, actually, I travel in a car, although I would like to be elsewhere, but the alternative options are simply not good enough. You had another third of people who said, I have no alternative to the car, and actually, I also like it. Uh, you had other people who would say, well, I like driving a car, but I wouldn't have to. And you had others who say, I really don't like driving a car, uh, but there is no alter objective alternative. So the way people react to different options for driving really depends on their actual needs. And uh, this is why I think that we will see uh, these new mobility options in parallel to what we are doing for a very long time. Thomas, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Thomas Becker, Vice President of Sustainability and Mobility at the BMW Group. Fascinating to get these insights, even though some of the questions had a degree of skepticism about the way mobility is moving. But at least you have clarity and you've been able to share with us what thank it means when uh, we don't do sustainability we make the BMW Group sustainable. Thanks very much indeed for your time and uh, also supporting this forum. It's much appreciated. Well, uh, as we so heard much, from Dr. Becker, um, as we heard from Dr. Becker, we have the uh, challenge of those who want to go to work, those living in cities, 60% of the world living in cities, it's rising fast. Uh, what does that mean for 
uh, how people are going to move. We've heard the BMW view that people still want to have that kind of level of mobility.